I was born in the, I forget the name of that hospital, but it probably wasn't the same hospital. Yeah. But Long Beach, yes, we were born in Long Beach. So yeah. in, interestingly, my grandfather was actually born in Kauai, and um, his parents were indentured servants that came over from Portugal. And so then he was born here, ended up lying about his age when he was like 16, joined the Navy, and then ended up in Long Beach, where he met my grandmother. And that's where our family kind of started. So you're a Portuguese? Quarter. Quarter Portuguese. Quarter Portuguese. Cool. Yeah. yeah. How, how'd you end up in Long Beach? What did your parents do? My mom and dad were from the East Coast. My mom came from a large family from New England side, you know, Northern Carolina. Carolinas. My dad was born in Illinois, Birmingham. I mean, excuse me, Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, after the war, my dad met my mom in a VA hospital, uh, World War II, and they moved up to California. Okay. To, you know, I think that there was big opportunities in those days to come out west. And and so we settled, uh, born in Long Beach, and then settled in Laguna Beach in 1949. Oh, wow. I was born in 48, and uh, then we settled in Laguna in 49. Man, I did um, a podcast series with Dick Metz. Yeah. And he told me all about growing up in Laguna in like the 30s right. is when he was born. I knew Dick, Dick when I was just a small kid. Really? Was he? So he's older than you by a Oh, yeah, bit. quite a bit. In his 80s. 15 years or something? Yeah. yeah. I'm 71. He's about 80. He's 90, I think. He's 90 now, now. Yeah. yeah. But... Man, has that area changed? His stories about it were just wild, you know, trying to envision that. Um, what was it like growing up there for you? Well, you know, I'm writing an autobiography right now about my life, and I decided that I'd start out with my earliest memories, you know. And Laguna, we were, my mom and dad made this very uh, brilliant decision to settle in South Laguna, you know. Uh, right after the war so you know California in those days was a two-lane road from San Diego to Oregon there were no freeways if you were to go from the ocean and walk to the top of the mountain all you could see was more mountains and more growth and not a single house not a single car you could see deer you could see possum rattlesnakes once in a while we got a little brown bear you know, or black bears sometimes, but, you know, it was California went through a very, very um, rapid growth period in the 50s. And, um, but I was lucky enough to have that, those early days there. It was virgin, you know. Totally. Um, we were, we were born right at night. I mean, I was raised right at Ninth Street Beach in South Laguna. So we got to see um, there was a pod of killer whales that would come through there every spring and, and early, you know, they'd be looking for the seals. We'd have seals on the beach all the time. Um, just an abundance of uh, game in the water, you know, everything was just... Uh, uh, when man started pumping detergents into the ocean right around 1952 when the dishwasher was available, that was the demise of the oceans in California. Interesting. And pretty soon, you know, over a longer period of time, the abalone died out, then the urchins died out. And, uh, of course, in those days, too, they were farming kelp. There'd, there'd be these big, giant harvesting machines in the kelp beds they were using. I guess that was for iodine. Um, but, yeah, it was an abundant, beautiful, uh, beautiful place to grow up in. It was country. Doesn't take long to decimate it. No, it doesn't. You know, when you get a large population of people, I mean, L.A., you know, L.A. and Hollywood, that was kind of the hub of the the metropolis of, of California, and it spread outward. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that happens everywhere, right? Um, do you remember your first introduction to surfing? Mm. Well, growing up on the beach... And having Dana Point a couple of miles away and Newport Beach and Huntington Beach and Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, 
a few miles to the north. We were in the epicenter of surfing, right? Palos Verdes was the early um, springboard, the early historics of surfing in the 30s, early 30s and 40s. We had San Onofre to the south, uh, which started up in those days, you know, it was like kind of like right after the war, um, there was a lot of, lot of like, you could probably, probably could call them bohemians, you know, guys that just lived on the beach and lived off the land and surfed and, and had that kind of lifestyle, you know. So growing up in, in Southern California and South Laguna, you know, when we were kids, we, we had rafts that we used to um, stand up on. We had skim boards that we used to stand up on and slide into the ocean on. So our, all of our early training was just getting us prepared for this event of riding surfboards. So when I was, my first surfboard I ever saw when I was eight years old, I was walking down the beach in the morning and this balsa wood board floated up to the beach. It was like a, it looked immense to me. It had to have been 10 or 11 feet. It had barnacles on the fin. It was kind of scummy looking and uh, it had been in the ocean for a long time, but it washed ashore. So I'm trying to drag it up the beach, right? Eight years old, trying to drag this giant plank up the beach and uh, the lifeguard comes down, John Parlett. Hey, hey Billy, uh, what did you find here? I said, I found my surfboard. Oh, that's nice. He picked the surfboard up. And the last thing I saw of my surfboard was it walking away. <laughs> But I remember it was so clear, the, the logo on the deck was this red, kind of almost looked like enamel. It was Velzy Surfboards in uh, Dana Point and it had a, a number on it. And it was red with gold lettering. I'll never forget that. That was the first tattoo memory of a surfboard. And um, so as I was growing up in, in 1959, a couple... They had built this house right on the beach, an A-frame house on the beach at 9th Street. Uh, and his name was Dick Pettit and his wife's name was Joyce. And they were a beautiful, handsome couple. He worked, he was a salesman for a fiberglass company. And she, she was a commercial artist and painted uh, cartoons for Popeye cartoons. She did all the colorations for that stuff. And they become, came like my second parents. So I used to hang out their house a lot. And she and him were surfers. And so they had a couple of boards, so I kind of inherited one of her boards. And in 1959, I rode my very first wave at Dana Point Cove, when Dana Point was still a surf spot before it, um, you know, before it turned into a marina. And then sometimes in the summer, we go down to K39 in Baja and surf down there before there was anybody there, you know. Mm -hmm. So those are my earliest memories of of surfing. Of course, we had all you know. Hobie Alter was in Dana Point. I had, we had Joe Quigg in Newport. So we had two of the greatest craftsmen in the world making surfboards right where I live. So it was really, I mean, for me not to become a surfer would have been really strange. Right. I was headed in that direction at a really early age, and. Um, I fell in love with surfing. I really just, it was something that um, really, um, I, I coexisted with that idea in a really big way. So um, I got pretty good at it pretty quick. By the time I started in 1959, in 1966, I was considered one of the best. I was kind of like a prodigy in that sense, but I loved it so much. And I sur lived and surfed and breathed surfing, you know, and of course all those early surfing movies and seeing Greg Knoll and uh, uh, Ricky Gregg and Jose Angel and all those great pioneers riding the North Shore just was like, oh my God, I'm going to do that too, you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew that when I was 12 years old, I knew I was going to do that. What? Did, how did your parents feel about you getting into the lifestyle? You know, my dad was a hardworking from that period of time, like a lot of dads, he was a workman. He was also a musician. He played music at night. Um, he had an orchestra during the war years that he played. He played Virginia Beach, and then he played uh, 
uh, Avalon Ballroom and Rendezvous Ballroom, Newport Beach during the war years. And then um, I was raised with jazz, so he had a jazz quartet. So when he wasn't working his day jobs, he was Mr. Mom, so I'd go to these bars with him up in Newport and Costa Mesa. And, um, you know, I remember seeing, it would be a kind of like smoking, uh, you know, that whole generation embraced smoking, so there's smoke everywhere. And the bars were filled with smoke, and there was a guy, a black guy playing a clarinet, and a guy that looked like Buddy Holly playing the drums, and my dad played the lead trumpet, and it was just, and I had, uh, I had jazz in my blood from when I was like, from five years old on. So when I was going through high school, I was listening to Coltrane and and Dizzy Gillespie. I mean, a lot of different different groups. And the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were kind of like foreign to me. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So how did he feel about you getting into surfing? Well, he was like, um, you know, my parents were both liberal. My mom was an artist and she was also a musician. They lived in Laguna Beach. Laguna Beach was kind of like, before the beatniks, there was the Bohemians, and after the beatniks came the hippies. It was kind of a very liberated place to be, and I think my mom and dad were very liberated. So in the sense that we were given all these freedoms with a, a wide open beach and an ocean to go to, my mom loved to swim. She'd swim in, out in the kelp bed. She was an ocean swimmer. Um, so they, our lives, our liberal uh, beach ocean life was very liberating and so um, he wasn't really a task maker in the sense you stay home and you work and you do this and that he he kind of left I'm the I'm the middle brother I have an older brother and I have a younger brother um, so we were kind of left to do our own thing with our friends, you know. So they were okay with it? Yeah, so... Well, I mean, like, in the 70s, you know, there's the hippie culture and surfers are outcasts and that sort of thing, counterculture maybe, but I think before that, I have this vision of surfing being more regal and the guys doing it were, like, really athletic and so maybe it wasn't so counterculture back then. It was actually revered. Well, prior, it was, to the drug, I mean, prior to the drug movement? Yeah, no, I think, the, you know, the early surfers... I would have to say most of the guys that I knew around the ocean that had anything to do with the ocean when I was growing up were really athletic people, yeah. very strong people. Um, we lived at, uh, you know, at the top of Ninth Street from about 1960 on for till I graduated from high school in 1966. My dad bought a house up there. So we had the, I guess they referred to it as a thousand step beach. Yep. So that was the beach that I grew up on. And so uh, sometimes, you know, the the fire department in South, South Laguna was a volunteer fire department. So anytime that siren went off, where any of those volunteer firemen were, they'd, they'd go. And there was three guys. When that siren went off, they would put these big black packs on that were like UDT black packs from World War II. And they'd run up those stairs like, I mean, lickety split. I mean, they were in great shape, and they were divers, you know, they were great divers and fishermen, and and uh, I think that most of the people that pursued surfing in those days were of that caliber, Right. you know? Yeah. And that was the, and it was a very small community, you know, and really at the very edge of society. Right. Well, I know, um, so you, Surfing Prodigy, I know you, did you win the Brooks? street contest i won it uh yeah in my junior year yeah and then shortly after high school so kind of based on that shortly after high school you find yourself in hawaii well let's let's go back a little bit but when i was 13 i was i was asked to be my friend juan shelton and i were asked to be in the wind and sea surf club and at that period of time it was a real elite club they took the best surfers from different parts of California to be a part of that club. That's when clubs, you know, right around that age, 13, 14, the, you had the Long Beach Surf Club. Most every place where there was a surfing community, Malibu, Haggerty's, Palos Verdes, Long Beach Surf Club, Huntington Beach Surf Club, Newport, we had clubs everywhere. So um, that was a big, big deal in growing up. And that's when 
contests were kind of heavily promoted up and down the coast. So we would be in, in club competitions quite a bit and individual competitions. And then surfing became uh, more regimented in the sense that there were, you had AAA, uh, you had 4A surfers, you had AAA surfers and, and surfers of less caliber. So they were starting to get graded in their, in their expertise as what they could do. And it was getting more and more, um, you know, it was like surfing was becoming bigger. By now, this is like 1963, 64, Gidget had already opened up people's minds to what surfing was, you know. And so there was a lot of interest in that. And that's when some of the first promotional stuff out of Hawaii was coming to TV, which was the Macaw International Championships that was filmed by the Wide World of Sports. So that was on from like 1962. I remember watching that in 1962 as a kid and watching Rabbit Kagai win it. And I remember, wow, I, I want to get to Hawaii. So in 1963, the Witness Sea Surf Club sold, we sold raffle tickets and stuff. We chartered a prop plane out of San Diego and filled that plane with some of the greatest surfers in the world. You know, Mickey Dora, Phil Edwards, Butch Van Arts, Dalen, Mickey Munoz, Joey Cavell, Hobie Alter, all the greatest names in the world are on that plane. And we're going to Macaw to go surf the Macaw meet. Wow. So With surfboards. Yeah. And so this is uh, right around, you know, early December. So we were there like December and, and New Year. So we were there in 1964. Um, I surfed Macaw. I was 14 years old and I surfed 12 foot Macaw, the biggest surf I'd ever been in. And um, I remember Joy Cabell was one of the lifeguards. So he, he was paddling out with me. He goes, Billy, hang with me, hang with me. I'm going to show you where to sit, you know. So he stationed me right at the bowl, right at the apex of the, you know, the A-frame of the bowl. And I caught the biggest wave of my life. It had to have been 10 feet. It seemed like it took forever to get to the bottom. I make it to the channel, I'm paddling back out, but the currents pull me back into the bowl and here comes like a three wave, 12 foot set and I get caught inside, right? So I didn't know anything about surfing in Hawaii and, and I, I figured, well, I'll just get in the channel and swim in. Well, you don't, in Hawaii, you don't swim in the channels. That's where all the rip is, so. I was going out to this place called Claus Myers, and uh, I mean, I'm going out to sea. And I see this big black Hawaiian guy paddling out to me. He goes, hey boy, you need one right? I go, yeah, he said, I'll get on my boy. So he paddled me and it was Blue Makua Sr., one of the greatest um, beach boys of all time, you know. So I'm starting to, to get connected with some of the great people in surfing. Right? I'm like hanging out with Joy Cabell. I'm hanging out with Butch Van Arsdale. And, um, I'm starting to become a name within surfing also. So now I'm kind of like, I'm sewn in with, with these groups of, of guys. So I ended up hanging out. I was like 14, 15 years old. I was smoking cigarettes. I was getting drunk on the weekends. I was hanging out with guys that were 25, 26, 28, 30 years old, you know. And I felt completely normal within their uh, being part of their group, you know. So I kind of grew up early in that sense. Um, by the time I was 18, I stopped drinking and smoking and and uh, I became more of an athlete. Which, yeah, it's just like I had this, I had went through this. Well, my brother was a hell's angel, so there was a little bit of delinquent period there within the, uh, you know, when I was like 10, my brother who was three and a half years older than me, became a, a young Hells Angel. And then pretty soon he was, he was running with the big gangs and, you know, uh, getting, uh, you know, driving stolen cars and running from the police, getting shot at. And he was a radical, radical guy, but he was kind of, he was my big brother and he was part of my upbringing, so. Did he survive that lifestyle? No, he didn't. He committed suicide when he was 28. Wow. He was mainlining uh, LSD and methadrine, and that's, that's probably a very horrible combination, but he ended up in a mental institution for about three months, and uh, and then he came to, uh, last time I saw my brother, he lived in Del Mar, and he was, uh, 
he worked at the Del Mar racetrack. Uh, he was a hot walker for the race uh, race horses. Okay. And that was the last time I saw my brother. But uh, that's tragic. Yeah, it was a hard one. So you hard, very hard for my parents. But. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you quit drugs and alcohol and smoking at the age of eighteen. Well, I didn't quit drugs. Actually, I took up drugs. Oh, I took okay. up LSD and smoking pot. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, which, you know, our generation embraced. Although right. President Clinton said he only inhaled, I doubt it. I think he lied. <laughs> you think? <laughs> well, we know what happened. A with politician Michael, right? lied? Of course you... he lied. Anyway, shocking. Shocking. Um, so that was your first trip to Hawaii, but you ended yeah, up. That was moving. 1964. And. Uh, so I had, I was injected with Paradise, and that was, that was a very seminal event in my life, and it was hard for me to make it through high school after that, because all I wanted to do was come to Hawaii and serve. So when I graduated in 1966, I think to please my parents, I went to Orange Coast College for about 20 minutes and ripped up the entrance exam, put in the circular file. Went to uh, and worked for Joy Cabell at the Chart House in Newport Beach and saved my money and went to Hawaii in late 1966. And that's when I started getting popular with Greg McGilvery and Jim Freeman Filmmakers. and their filmmake, filmmaking group. Um, I was always uh, Ron Stoner, who was a big, uh, you know, one of the best photo photographers of that time, was always. A, he was a friend of mine. He'd always come by my house and have dinner. I had a I had a car, a Chevy that I, I bought from John Creed that I'd drive around. He'd just follow me and, and photograph me all the time. So I became really popular in the magazines because I had this great photographer following me around, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, in fact, the newest Surfer magazine right now has two of Stoner's pictures of me in that magazine. It's crazy. I mean, of all the people... Of, of all those decades of time, I get two shots. I, that's a, to me, that's really like, that's a big honor for me. But It's huge. Yeah. And that was, I mean, that was such an iconic era yeah. of surfing. Iconic right? it was. And not a lot of photographers. So. Right. Yeah. So when I was on the North Shore, um, Greg and Jim uh, were filming a, a movie called Free and Easy. So they took Mark, uh, Martins, and myself. Um, to Kauai, 1966, here on Kauai, and and we got to uh, surf all the breaks that I surf now, and we discovered one break called Rifle Range on the west side. Um, because of the uh, military base there? Yeah, we well, we had, had a lot of experience when we were growing up with a, a military base at Camp Pendleton, in the San Onofre thing, so... We used to sneak in there a lot, and uh, I even had a couple of MPs that I bribed in there that were my friends, so I could park my car in the jungle, you know, and I'd leave them a bottle of Jack Daniels under the front seat. Sometimes it'd be there, sometimes it wouldn't, and I knew my friends had showed up, the MPs. Right? That's funny. So anyway, we, we'd had all this experience of going into military bases, so we pulled up in the military base, and they denied, our, denied us access because it was a, you know, it was a actually a very top secret military base. So we decided, well, we know how to get into that base. We'll just drive down a couple of miles and park the car. And we walked to the property uh, unencumbered. It took what we thought would take us about 20 minutes, took us about two hours because inside that, the, from the main road to the beach was a huge forest of Kiawe trees and Kiawe have thorns on them about an inch long. And so we literally, you know, Greg and Jim were wearing shoes and, and Mark and I were wearing um, sandals. So the thorns were going through our sandals and we're just, so we decided that we had, he had a 10 foot long board, I had a 10 foot long board. So we, we made a sidewalk out of our long boards. So it took us about an hour and a half wow. to get to this place called, uh, we called it Whispering Sands in the movie, but today they call it um, rifle range because up in that and that area is a rifle range for for their you know military guys and so we get this sand dune we walk over and it's like perfectly beautiful glassy day it was about shoulder high 
you know, four or five wave sets. It was just absolutely perfect. One of those moments, you know, that you just get to have very rarely in your life. But we got to surf that place. And I remember asking some of the old timers here, do you guys ever surf on the base or get in? No, no, they'd never done, they never knew about it. I'd have to go back and watch that footage. I can't imagine you riding that style of wave on those style of boards. It was really difficult. Yeah, the wave, for listeners who don't know, is a thumping beach break. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting you'd say that because in the movie, it appears like we are, you know, we're catching waves and making waves. But I think for the 10 waves that I rode, I think I made two waves. Okay. Most of the time, it was being, I was pitch pulling because I was purling or sliding out because it was so hollow. It was really hard to ride a longboard there. Yeah. I don't know if you could see this hematoma. That's what that's from, is surfing there just the other day. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's... Did it fit and get you? What, yeah. The cut isn't that bad. It's more just the blunt force of it that you know, swelled it up. It's doing a lot better now, though. Um, so then I left... Um, uh, ran out of money on the North Shore. And while I was making this movie... I met the the first love of my life, Joanne, who was had this little boy named Laird, and he was two and a half years old. And uh, I met them. They were actually staying at Greg McGilvery's house. They'd come from Maui, so that was a that's a whole story in and of itself, you know. And it's yeah. probably been pretty well documented. But well, we'll I I do want to actually retell that story as well, even though it's been documented. But let's come back to it in a minute. Um, when you guys did that trip over here and were filming for those movies, how did you know which spots to surf? What was your exposure to the surf spots on Kauai? And then also, who were the surfers here at that time? Well, we didn't find out till later on that Greg Knoll had come here in 1956 and actually camped out at the end of the Honolulu Pier for a couple of days looking for big waves. And I don't think they found much surf. and that, It never appeared in any of his films that he'd made at that time. But pretty much by and large, most of the surfers during that period of time were going to Maui and surfing Honolulu Bay. That was the destination. Nobody came to Kauai. So Kauai was really completely under the radar. It was completely unknown. So all the places that we were looking at were unknown to us. We didn't know where any of the surf spots were. You were totally we had just no exploring. idea. We were chill. You know, it was kind of like, and when we arrived, the day we arrived, it, there was a Kona storm. It was blowing from the southwest about 25 knots. The swell was about probably 10 or 12 feet. And it was like white water everywhere. And we couldn't really tell, you know. So it took, we were here for nearly two weeks. So, uh, and we stayed right at Pine Trees. And so we, that was our epicenter. And then we drove, we drove, drive out to the end of the road. And one day we surfed cannons. Uh, on our long boards, which was difficult. Once again, another wave of, you know, s some commitment and definitely, a, a, you know, an outcome. Hollow. Hollow. Steep. So um, Mark's first wave, he purled, went over the falls, hit the reef, and, and lacerated his back. My wave, I, I, I went down, slipped out sideways. We both lost our boards. I swam. Mark and I are standing on the reef, and I'm looking at both of our bar boards bobbing around out in front of the YMCA camp out in deep water. And I'll have to tell you, when we were on Kauai, it looked like a real sharky place. Because, you, you know, on Oahu, you don't have all that reefy, and the, the waves aren't really that far out in the ocean. Well, most of the waves that, on Kauai, have a, it's an outside reef. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's going to be a lot of sharks around there. So, of course, you know, there's blood in the water. And I told Mark, I said, Mark, you're not going in the water again. I'll, I'll swim. To get. It was like one of the longest swims of my life to get out to the boards and bring them back in. It was really scary. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was part of the adventure. Turns out you were right about the sharkiness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully we didn't see any on that journey. But. Yeah. Um, so who were the surfers on Kauai at that time? Did you encounter? We didn't know, we didn't know of anybody here. But there uh, were. Yeah, there were there were surfers, and I would meet them later on when I okay. lived here. Uh, Carlos Andrade was one of the main ones. Uh, apparently, Jerry Lopez on the south side was, grew up over there. Never knew, knew that. 
Yeah. Um, there were some older guys named Nick Beck, who was a principal of the elementary school, and John Bylander, his friend. Um, um, Afuk Taihuk, who, who has a, one of uh, Dick Brewer's original boards he made on, at uh, Surfboards Hawaii in Haleiwa in 1958, and he still has that. And he said we used to surf, they referred to Hanlei Bay as hotels then, because that's when the old plantation hotel was there. That was the only, the only commercial place out on the North Shore was, you know, that way before Princeville. Princeville was a cow pasture. That was, that was just farmland, and just empty lot. Right. So, so, so we didn't, so we didn't see any surfers while we were here. Okay. Uh, except we surfed uh, one Saturday afternoon in Honolulu. It was like a day like today, hot and glassy and kind of like head high. And there was one big Hawaiian lady surfing out the bowl, but I didn't see anybody else. Wow. Yeah. Um, how were you getting around on that trip? Did you guys rent a car? We had you... a little rental car. Okay. We had a rental car. I had four doors, and we we roped our boards down and tied the rope inside. And uh, gotcha. And I remember they charged uh, ten cents a mile. And Mark was kind of a wizard at mechanics, so he, he disconnected the, the cable, so so Greg wouldn't have to pay so much at the end of the trip. Amazing. <laughs> um, I don't know where this fits into the timeline, but when were you introduced to board building? Well, that's what happened after I left Oahu. Uh, Joanne and I moved back to Encinitas. She had been, she had gone to school and graduated from San Diego High in Encinitas. She was five years older than I was. So I was 17 and a half when I married her, and um, and Laird was two and a half. So, so my claim to fame was that I changed Laird's diapers when he was two and a half years old. <laughs> His last pair, by the way. Okay, so let's. Now that I know the timeline, let's start with the Laird story then. When, so while, how did you encounter Laird? Yeah, so while I'm on the North Shore, this is 1966, uh, December, yeah, December of 1966, because I turned, uh, Laird turned uh, three in March. So um, I was walking down the beach to from Pipeline to Rocky Point where Greg and Jim had their home. And uh, I'm walking up to their house, and right below where they were staying is Rocky Point. And it's kind of, Rocky Point's kind of a, has a little reef area outside, and inside's kind of a lagoon. So it's fairly protected for swimming there. And I saw this little kid, little blonde-haired kid in green shorts, playing around the, the water. And I hadn't, in all the times that I'd been out on the North Shore, I'd never seen a child, really. There wasn't hardly any children there at all, you know. Um, later on, I'd find out who had the children. You know, there's a couple of families there. But so I went down and I said, "Hey, what are you doing?" He goes, "Swimming." I go. So I jumped in the water with him. I said, "What's your name?" He goes, "Laird." I go, "Where are you from?" He goes, "Maui." I go, "What are you doing?" He goes, "I'm playing in the water." And you know, I don't know, forget what the conversation was. And I said, "I said, do you want to learn how to body surf?" And he goes, "Yeah." I said, hang on to my neck, we'll go body surf. So I swam out across the lagoon, went out to the edge of the, the reef and waited for the waves to, to roll across and then dissipate into the, into the deeper water and I jump in the white water. And we go about three or four feet and he just, he just loved that. It's just like, that was, you know, that was the first of many adventures for him. But um, so, you know, all of a sudden we're fast friends um, we're leaving the beach, and he grabs my hand. He says, "I want you to come. I want you to come meet my mom." So it, he takes me up to the house where I'm going to. Right? They were staying there, and uh, we we go up and open the door, and, and there goes, "Mom, this is Bill." I went, "Hi, how are you?" And I went, "Wow, <laughs> mom's a fox, you know." Yeah. Mom was a beautiful woman. So anyway, long story short, we we had this. Wonderful Polly and Love affair on the North Shore. We lived at the the house that we would eventually live in when we came back to the North Shore a year later. But then we flew to Encinitas. Um, we got married um, and, and settled into a little place there. And I got a job with uh, Gordon and Smith learning how to um, finish gloss surfboards. And then 
I was starting to, you know, it's like guys wanted me to ride their boards. So John Price at Surfboards Hawaii asked me if he said, I'll, you know, I'll pay you to ride for me and give you free boards. And he, his offer was stands down way better than what Greg Gordon and Smith was giving me, right? So I was, that year I was on the cover of Surfer Magazine and I took it to Larry Gordon. I go, Larry, I said, you guys make me pay for my boards. I said, doesn't that help you out? He goes, yeah, a little bit. He said, trade your boards and we'll just give you back. And I said, okay, cool, you know. So, um, was that cover shot shot on the North Shore? No, I, I, no, it was shot in California. Oh, it was okay. So, um, let me ask you real quick. Um, how did you feel about being 17 and a half years old and getting married to somebody who had a kid? That doesn't well, seem like I, what a lot of I think of... my parents were a little bit more concerned about it than I was. Okay, I remember my mom was a little bit pissed off by the fact that. I was so cavalier about everything, but, uh, you know, I had never been in love with a woman before, for one, and this was not like your little high school infatuation. This is something that I had a deep soul, soul caring for, for this woman, and the boy was a part of her, and I had not a second thought in the sense that I was going to become his his stepfather and raise him and do the best I could. I just... It was part of my forward movement through life. I, I never questioned the event. I never did, ever. It was just part of the. It was part of the package. I'm, love I love this woman. She has a child. It's part of the whole picture. Love it. I didn't. I didn't have any other deciphering idea for it other than the fact that I just accepted it as what it was. And the thing is, is that you have to understand that the our generation. Uh, Young kids, really, you know, young young people. We were we were marrying and having children at a young age. A lot of it wasn't Planned Parenthood. It was just from having you know free love, yeah. quote unquote, kind of thing. And then that just being just accepting that as being part of the rhythm of our life. Totally, you know. So no questions asked. You got a kid, great, good on you. You know, it was no stress. It's like. There was no stress in the fact that, oh, man, you're going to have a kid. And not, you know, it wasn't a worrisome event like it is today. School and, you know, you name it. it, was, it up. was Laird's biological father out of the picture? Not yet. Um, I had a conversation with him one day. It didn't last very long. He was kind of gruff. I want to talk to Joanne. I said, okay. I remember he was kind of like, kind of hard, had a hard voice. Um but I never met him, and the year that I was going to meet him, uh, he was 62, and he died when he was 62. Okay. He was a, he became a professor of economic, I mean, a professor of uh, mathematics in Tahus, New Mexico. And I think probably uh, Laird has that, kind of that mathematical brilliance, you know. Um, Laird has, we thought, he had a problem with as a child because he never really, it seems like he never really slept. He rocked quite a bit. He'd rock himself to sleep so hard sometimes it would, you know, the house that we lived in was single wall construction. He'd make the kind of that one wall just shake the house. But, Interesting. Yeah, so we took him to a doctor. The doctor said that he might be, have a, he might be a manic or have some sort of condition that required him to give him like something called phenobarbital, which is basically a speed. And it turned Laird into one of the characters in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I went, this is not going to happen on my watch. But we're going to take Laird for whoever he is and whatever he is. And we're going to, you know, we'll sail with that. I don't want to have anything to do with this, the medical part of this. Right. So if he's got a problem, we'll figure it out along the way, you know. Well, I think, you know, he's got ADHD or some other, they call it a, um, nowadays they call it a, um, um, it's not a, it's considered a, um, a special kind of a condition. It's not considered abnormal. It's a, a special kind of condition that gives, actually gives these guys cutting edges in what they're doing. You know? Now that we've seen Laird's life play out, could you imagine if they, uh, hampered that with drugs? Well, yeah, you know, that was the thing is that we would have, we would have stifled nature on its course, really, you know. And I'm sure it has been for a million other kids. Yeah. Whose parents yeah, put them many, on the drugs. Yeah, many, many, many. Um, and it's, 
uh, it's been a real uh, it's been a real joy to watch his journey because I don't think he was very happy as a child. He okay. was very, um, you know, they say that when you have those kind of conditions, you don't feel comfortable in your own body, kind of thing, you know. But I do. When he was growing up, I remember he used to seg segment his food. He was religious about having his peas in one place, his salad, his corn, his potatoes, his meat, everything was segmented. Nothing was mixed together. When he played with his blocks, they were blue blocks and red blocks. And when he put them back, he put them back in order. So he has this complex, I think, very, um, very calculating kind of mind that's, you know, when I watch him go out after big waves, you know, and I've been out there on many occasions with him when they were first towing and I was part of the helping the development of those boards and that, uh, that engineer, but he would, you know, his, he would signal to his, his partners, either Nelly or Derek Dorner with his hand, you know, and he'd always go, he had one, two, three or four, you know, and it was always, always using his index finger to going further, further, further out. And he'd point to two, then he'd go, no, he'd always have this hand language of raising his hand and going three. And then, he, you know, it'd be a, a definite, a definite three. We're going for the third one. Yeah. So um, he had a vision and his judgment and his vision and also his partner, Terry Chun, has that vision, too. He's an excellent uh his his being in the water where he's supposed to be at the right time is spot on. It's calculated. It's very calculated. Well, I threw you off track by asking you about, um, you know, feeling any reticence about marrying a woman with a kid, but you were telling me about John Price and the role that he played in your yeah, life. Yeah, um, anyway, uh, so John gave me a job. Um, this is leading up to my shaping career, right? right. So... Uh, Surfboards are still in the longboard stage. We're, this is the 1966-67. I've designed a model for surfboards, what I call the stylist mm -hmm. one and two. Um, and I was, uh, 19, this is 1967. And, and um, I think it was the World Contest of 68 in San Diego when everything changed when that young won that event on that shorter board, that short long board. And uh, surfing uh, became a, really changed quickly. But what I'm saying about John is that he, he saw me as a, an investment in his business. So he paid me, I was a paid, you know, he paid me $500 a month in 1967, which is a lot of money. I got all the boards I wanted. Um, he let me do whatever I wanted and work with. I like to finish boards. Um, I learned how to sand. I learned how to glass. I learned how to make surfboards. So I had the skill of, of building surfboards at the age of 18, 17, 18, that I was able to bring to Hawaii and use that partially as a, you know, eventually as a full on business, but it, you know, kept me going. So what brought you back to Hawaii? Well, the surfing, you know, I had already lived on the North Shore for a little while. I was like, you know. So what year, did you move back to Oahu or did you move back to Kauai at that point? We moved back to Oahu. Gotcha. So we lived, um, we moved in a place that Jeff Johnson uh, eventually lived in, and that's where his son J uh, Jack and, and all his, his uh, family was raised. Um, and then uh, the pipeline house opened up. My friend uh, John Thurston, who was living there, he lived downstairs. He said, I'm going to be leaving soon. You want this spot? I said, yeah. So Joanne and I Lair and Laird moved down down below. And then there was a guy named uh, John uh, Peter uh, 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 Kurt Mastalka. Kurt Mastalka was a kind of an early movie maker. And he lived there and had been there for some time. Now, I'm talking about the house. When they refer to the pipeline house, the Jerry Lopez house, well, it was that property before that house was built. So gotcha. that was off K. Nui Road. And so our our house literally was situated right in front of the pipeline. Okay. And I and that that lawn where that that pipe house eventually was built, I made a, a, a corral for my wife. She had a... a an Appaloosa horse, and so we had a horse 
there, and it was really like an idyllic country setting. Holy and God. I had a little chair under the pine, palm trees, and um, on several occasions I watched Perfect Pipe with nobody out except me, or sometimes Jock Southern would come by with a second reef pipe, we'd smoke a joint and paddle out and get the shit scared out of ourselves. Yeah. Um, nobody around. Body surf pipeline on full moons many occasions. Surfed it one night completely naked on 11 foot board. Full moon, like three foot. It's beautiful. Unreal. Yeah. Pipeline. These so I got to have pipeline when. So Butch Van Artsdalen was the king of pipeline, and I lived there. And Butch would take showers at our place. Yeah, I'd have lunch for him. Bud Brown would come. He was filming at the time. Bud would come down. We'd feed Bud Brit, uh, dinner. So Laird was getting to relate and have these uh, contacts with all these great surfers at the time, you know. Uh, Butch and him had a special kind of relationship. Butch loved kids. So Butch would hold Laird by the forehead and say, okay, all right, kid, show me what you got. So Laird would start swinging like a windmill, right? And then it's the old trick, right? Lift the palm off the forehead. You know, Laird falls to the ground swinging. But Laird gets up and starts crawling up, punches. <laughs> it's like he's, it's so, like he's got this wild monkey crawling up him, you know? Yeah, he had no was, idea how tenacious Laird yeah, was. Yeah, Laird was very tenacious. Um, so then uh, there was Jock Sutherland, who was, you know, he was the, the guy who held held the held the, the crown out there for a number of years. Yeah. And then I remember seeing this young guy from Honolulu come out. His name was Jerry Lopez. And then Roy Russell, and I got to see that all. I got to see the whole evolution of the species. Why in the world would you ever leave that scenario? That sounds, you got the horse out front, your family, you're in the prime spot. Well, like all places, all good places, they change, right? Okay. So the landlord who owned the property, um, he sold the house. His name was Mr. Nanaka. And Mr. Nanaka decided that, for whatever reason, he sold the house to a guy named Paul, uh, Fat Paul. And Fat Paul bought the place, I remember, for $90,000 in 1969. And in 1969, 1970, a friend of mine named Billy Pond, who lived at the, the concert house at, at Rocky Point, uh, was shot in the head in the middle of the night. And he was shot because they were looking for drugs and he was the wrong guy. Wow. So what happened was the sale of the property, one. Two, there was this syndicate kind of drug related thing going on out there that was getting more and more uh, pervasive and um, and I decided that I was going to have my 19th nervous breakdown and after uh, Lion was born, Laird's brother was born in 1969 I decided that I was going to leave for a while and figure out what the hell I was doing with my life. And so I moved to Kauai and moved in with a guy named Bunker Spreckles, who had just inherited $100 million and had nowhere else to spend it except on his friends. So we were living this very wealthy lifestyle in Kauai, uh, you know, eating out uh, every night, um, surfing really beautiful waves. And I was, uh, I was basically sowing some wild oats that I hadn't been able to sow in my life. It's 23 years old. And um, I was going, and I, it took me about two and a half weeks to figure out that I think I need to raise my family here on Kauai. So I went back, I told Joanne, I said, look, I'm not going to divorce you. I want to be with you. I want, I'm not going to abandon this beautiful family. I want to take you guys to the country and raise our children in the country. And it's deep country. This is like, we're the, like the first white family to move into Wainio, ever. It's like the first black people to move into Tennessee. Do you know what happens when that happens? Racial problems, right? Mm -hmm. So I never, I never even considered that. Just moving to Kauai and getting away from the, the changes of the North Shore was really important to me. That's what, what we did. And let me, pause and ask you 
what we should know about Bunker Spreckles. Bunker Spreckles was the um, heir to the the Claus Spreckles sugar Spreckles sugar's fortune, and um, he has a, a brother by by his, uh, his stepfather Clark Gable, who was a famous actor, and um, uh, and his and his sister is still alive, but. Um, Bunker was a real, Bunker had a lot of energy. He was, he had really everything going for him. He was good looking. He had natural athletic ability. He was smart as a whip. He had this real pure, good energy about him. And the problem was, is that money gave him Pandora's box and he wanted to open it and find out what was inside of it. And he did. And he didn't stop exploring. And it went deeper and deeper and deeper. And we watched him turn from a simple beach, healthy person to a rather decadent, uh, cheesy rock star. You know, it was sad to watch, but mm. it was of his own making. Uh, uh, in the movie, the Bunker movie, it has me and my friend Brian Kinley. We tried to pull him out of his heroin addiction. So we gave him some acid and took him to Hanukkah I. That was a pretty big event, but it didn't help him. You know, he was on, he was on his own journey. Yeah. But it was a real good example of the choices you make when you have a, an unlimited supply of money. Yeah. And uh, he made all the wrong choices. Do you feel like the film was an accurate representation? Very much so. Okay, good.